56. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, Hump Day Hangout at FireEngineering.com and FirefighterNation.com. Today is November 6th, uh, Wednesday. Uh, great show today. We have uh, lots to talk about. We're going to uh, hit a lot of good topics and really delve into uh, some of the recent goings-on as well. And, and, and um, for those of you uh, who don't know me, uh, I'm Eric Gordon, the editor-in-chief of Fire Rescue Magazine. And uh, today we have uh, Ron, Kenter, uh, Ron Kenterman and Tom Hammerhauer and uh, our Hammer, I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, um, we're like I say, a, a great show today. Uh, and for those of you that have any questions for today's uh, Hump Day Hangout, um, to text those or tweet those to uh, hashtag FE Talk. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, answering a lot of your questions, and we have uh, two very experienced uh, gentlemen uh, with us today that'll be able to. Uh, 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 give a lot of uh, great advice and, uh, and experience to some of these questions. So please uh, send those in uh, for us. Um, first, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ron Kennerman. Um, and uh, we have him uh, both gentlemen on live with us today. So, uh, Ron, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, good afternoon, guys. Eric, good to see you as always. And uh, of course, my partner, Tommy. Uh, what, what Eric didn't fail to tell you is that uh, Tommy and I are the Backstep Boys on Fire Engineering Blog Talk Radio once a month. And uh, it's the first time we're doing this uh, on camera, and we hate to disappoint all you thousands of guys out there that, that just heard the voices. Now you got to look at us, so we, we apologize for that. Uh, but I just I just celebrated 40 years in the fire service. Uh, I started out when I was a kid, uh, upstate New York, and doing some volunteer stuff, and then hanging around a firehouse in the city, and then eventually uh, uh, getting into the Fire Prevention Bureau in New York. And then after a, uh, a, a stay there, I was recruited into industry. So I had 20 years as an industrial chief uh, working for a, a large pharmaceutical company. And after industry, uh, well, I guess it was still kind of industry, I went to a hybrid fire department. We were part municipal and part uh, industrial, I, and I was the fire chief on an Indian reservation with a casino complex in southeast Connecticut. So we were we were we were a government agency, but not the United States government, so to speak. I was working for a tribal nation, and uh, currently, uh, I'm fortunate. Uh, I'm at a new command. Uh, started June 1st. I'm in Wilton, Connecticut. Wilton, Connecticut sits on the right on the New York State border, and in fact, uh, my wife and I moved back home to New York after 28 years. We're back home in New York again, and uh, the pizza's crispy and the Chinese food tastes real again. You know, my, I, I don't know what else to say about being home in New York, but. I'm at a great command now. I got a I got a small career department here, and and we're busy, uh, not necessarily running, but a lot of fire prevention work, and uh, we get the occasional emergency, a little bit of EMS work, and uh, other than that, uh, it's in fire service wise, I've been teaching at the college level for 25 years. Uh, I've been teaching uh, uh, for a couple of state fire marshals offices for recertification classes, and I've done just a little bit of writing for fire engineering. Uh, I have my blog site, Chief Canterman's Journal, and. Uh, uh, I'm waiting patiently for the new edition of the Fire Chiefs Handbook to come out. I did the uh, the health and safety chapter of the new Fire Chiefs Handbook, so I'm excited about that. They're going to hit the shelves shortly. So for, let me uh, turn down my, my firehouse intercom so you don't hear that again. But I'll, I'll turn it right to Tommy. Tommy Ehrenheimer, you're up, buddy. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a fifth-generation firefighter. Uh, originally started off my career in New Melbourne, New Jersey as a uh, volunteer uh, there for about four years. Uh, during that same period, I was also an auxiliary firefighter in Newark, New Jersey uh, in the late 70s, toward the, uh, the end of the war years. Uh, about 1980, I decided I wanted to do this for a career and uh, packed all my worldly belongings after getting a uh, firefighter job in Farmington, New Mexico. Spent uh, 23 years with the Farmington Fire Department, retired after spending uh, five years as the chief of department. Uh, got to be retired for two days and uh, started my secondary career here at the Los Pinos Fire District in Ignacio, Colorado. Uh, I'll be here uh, 12 years uh, next year. Uh, 38 years in the fire service right now. Ron, you got me by two. Uh, I'm an adjunct or a contract instructor with the National Fire Academy and uh, do uh, also a bunch of uh, adjunct work teaching at uh, various uh, educational venues, uh, FDIC, a uh, lot of state conferences, that kind of stuff. I've had the pleasure for, how long have we been on now? It's been over a year since uh, we've been back. It's like, 
It's about two and a half years back, Step Boys. It's how long? Uh, very proud of my uh, family tradition in the fire service. Uh, generation six. Uh, my nephew is currently in the fire academy in Essex County, New Jersey, and uh, I, I'm looking very forward to uh, to see what he's uh, <laughs> going to come up with after the other five generations have. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Mike, something my uh, grandfather attributed to a long line of people too lazy to work and too stupid to steal. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, since uh, Chief Houghton uh, was not able to join us today, I hope you guys don't mind, but I brought a guest into my office. I don't know whether you know little <laughs> Ronnie Canterman. <laughs> Wait for all the people, Ron. <laughs> you will be making an appearance every once in a while to say something, so... Good seeing everybody. <laughs> oh, great. All right. You know, I'll tell you what. Uh, you guys have uh, uh, obviously a few cups of coffee on the job. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, we, we can kind of segue in, into our, our topic for our for initial topic for today's Hangout. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the role of the IC, the, the uh, you know, maybe broaching some of the litigiousness behind uh, the role of the IC, but Specifically, you know what what goes behind that decision making, and what what uh, what is needed to make those sound uh, proper and uh, methodical decisions. And um, obviously, uh, you know if you've been you know following the the news feeds as of late, you you've, uh, you're aware of two major fire departments that are recently uh, eyeing the uh, the role of the incident commander at two uh, recent fatal fires. And you know we're not going to mention the, the departments specifically because both uh, investigations are uh, are still underway. And out of respect to them, you know we don't throw stones here or anything like that. But um, but it does bring the the role of the incident commander to the forefront, particularly because at these two fires, the role of the IC has trumped. Uh, and the, the main point of contention is is that it's, it's it's trumped the building, the staffing, the communications issues. They're talking about the incident commander first, which is uh, a rarity. Usually we you know that. You know, comes four or five recommendations down a lot in IASH reports, and we usually correlate that to communications. But um, let me throw a question out to Ron here: what What is the 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 role of the IC? Not not just in terms of generalities, but in, in terms of uh, the mission and the uh, the purpose on the fire ground. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, not not to be redundant because it, so much has been written on it already. You know, and, and so much has been has been discussed, but. Uh, you know, I, first and foremost, like people ask me about being a fire chief, what's your job? The, you know, people who aren't in the fire service. So my job is to bring my guys home. That's my job. Everything else is secondary. You know, we'll, we'll go out, do, do whatever we have to do, get the guys home in the morning so they can go home to their families and get the next shift in and do the same thing day after day after day. So that, that's really the job. But, but I, I think today, because people are really getting uh, scrutinous about the decisions that are made, and it's hard if if you've never done it, and, and of course you guys have, but but for for guys who've ne really never done it and been out, you know, in, in at an incident with a lot of people, uh, it's it's not easy to do. It's it's you have to train for it, you have to be ready for it mentally and, and all that other stuff. You got to have the right mental stamina uh, for making those decisions. And and it, interestingly enough, I, I got a call. Uh, Recently, from from a, a longtime fire engineering author and, and a mentor of mine, uh, I met him when I started college about 135 years ago. But uh, Jim Murtagh, uh, you know, Jimmy's been around a long time, and he, he's written a lot of stuff. And he he was the original. Him and Billy Goldfeder and Jeff Meston from California were the original guys who started boot camp for battalion chiefs at FDIC probably 10 or 15 years ago. And it's they've been running similar things since. Uh, uh, Jimmy was my, like I said, was my first professor when I was 17 years old in college, and, and we've been friends all this time. And he got together with myself and a, and a very little known guy named Jack Murphy from from North Jersey, who happened to be the lifetime achievement winner last uh, two years ago in fire engineering. And we started, to, we sat and talked about the, the the command process, the command process, not not necessarily, you know, J Jimmy had a load of experience. He did 35 years in New York City. You know, and and Jack and I didn't 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 quite measure up to his amount of experience, but we're looking at it from a couple of different angles. We, we're starting to work on a project, and we, the discussions we've had is not necessarily uh, what what you what you have complete control over. Some of the things that, that that I started to jot down was what we don't have control over in the command process, and and some of the things Jim talked about was what 
information do we need to be at the top all the time? Like he called it brain one and brain two. You know, we need, we need more in brain one than we need in brain two. And uh, how do we get to that point? And a lot of, some of those things come with uh, just in, in a simple, in a simple uh, uh, discussion about mutual aid. You know, uh, like here, I, I have a small career crew. I have six guys. So, so we go out the door. It's mutual aid on the way out the door. And, and knowing your mutual aid partners, knowing what they have, equipment, manpower, training-wise, you know, what, can, they, can they provide what you think they're going to provide when they get here, when they get to town? And I asked those questions when I got here. So it's, it's all that, those things. Some, some things we have control, some we don't have control. Th think about the current discussions we're having with Flowpath and all the stuff that Dan Madrakowski and Steve Carver have done. And we're all kind of looking at it now. And, and there were guys, Tom, I'll let Tommy speak on it for himself in a little while, but Tommy saw some stuff that was written years and years ago on the same stuff. And in fact, 20 years ago, I was having a discussion with Jim Murtaugh with a couple other guys. Well, he was having a discussion with the guys, and I was standing there listening, when he said, control the door, control the fire. I heard that 20 years ago from a guy like Jim. Control the door, control the fire. So when, when we look at that now, think about what the people in the building might do before we get there. We don't have control over that. But yet we're going there with the preconceived notion that we're going to take command of this incident and everything's going to go the way we hope it's going to go because we're going to put two guys over there, two guys on a roof, two guys inside, a search team, and do all the things that we do, but not knowing that before we got there, they chopped open every door inside the house. Or the, the owner, he went around with a hammer and took out six windows because he's seen it on television that firemen break windows. So there's a whole bunch of things, and, and it could go in our favor as well. When you go to an, an, a place that's, that has an organized fire brigade or has an organized uh, evacuation team, and they're walking around, they're, they're closing doors, and they're shutting windows, and they're doing all those things we want them to do and making sure everybody gets out of the building. So th those are kind of the, the, the things that we're talking about now, things that influence our decision-making that we don't have control over or perhaps maybe have control over if it goes the other way for us. Uh, Tom, did you want to weigh in on that? You know, there's a there's a number of things out there that, that come into uh, the play when you you look at the uh, the overall command of the the fire ground, and of course, you know, going back to the blue card basics of your rate functions of command, all those uh, fall into there. But uh, you know, Ron, you had mentioned what we have control over and, and don't have control over, and it's something that uh, you know relates back to critical factors. There are fixed critical factors such as the building type, the occupancy, and uh, the arrangement of that. And then there's those variable uh, critical factors of what's the fire doing? What are resources do we have? What's our action plan? Any special circumstances that are in there? All that comes into play as to what's going on. But, you know, uh, if, if you look at the way Blue Card's got it broke down to the initial arriving IC, which is probably the, the company officer on the first new piece of apparatus, what a, I, I feel sorry for those guys. I mean, they're running wild trying to get a 360 done, trying to figure out whether there's a basement in the building, go and see what's going on on the roof, get that overall picture where somebody in my position is coming in behind them as the IC2 or the strategically placed incident commander is going to use that basic information that's garnered from the first new IC to make decisions as to whether we adjust the initial action plan or uh, maybe make a change in strategy that the first two companies go by. But, you know, the bottom line is, and you hit it right on the head, uh, we got to make sure that everybody gets out of there. And I think a lot of the stuff that's coming out from the, uh, the studies that UL is doing, that NIST is doing, and the, uh, the information that's being put out by uh, the Society of Fire Service Instruction in the way of slicers uh, is, is going to make the fire ground safer for all of us. Uh, but, you know, the, the line of duty death thing, uh, I have nightmares about that. You know, thankfully, knock on wood, uh, 38 years doing this, uh, I've never been in a department that had suffered a line of duty death. But from what I'm seeing, that puts the department in such a fragile position to where, you know, accusations, finger pointing, uh, it can be in a very emotional, ugly, and nasty time for, for going out of, of what should be something that kind of brings us together as a brotherhood and, and, and learning the lessons from those who have gone on before us. But, man, it's it's getting tougher and tougher. Uh, I, I don't know whether I've got the answers for some of that stuff. 
but uh, I hate to see some of that uh, that occur. And uh, you know, Ron's mentioned it a number of times uh, during the radio show that you know we suffer a line of duty death. We're hearing a lot of stuff, but you know, keeping your guns holstered until we see what the reports uh, come either from a uh, an internal review, uh, an outside report by uh, state fire marshal's office, NIOSH reports, all the stuff that's out there that will eventually come to light. You know, I, 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 what happens is, is the brotherhood or the brothers, they, they, we tend to shoot from the hip when it happens. I mean, we've all done it, even now. We've, we've, we've done it where, where all of a sudden we're, where we hear a line of duty death or we, we get the first report and, and it's, it's – uh, you know, you say, how can that happen? How can look? But, but we have to be smart about it. The keeping the guns holstered. I got to tell you, I stole that from Bobby Halton, and you stole it from me. So that fits with the fire service model. We steal with pride. It's wonderful. Okay. But sure enough, uh, you, you have you have to wait and see and keep the gun holstered because it, we we can't be drawn on. We we had two tragedies in the last year. One in, here in in, in uh, Connecticut recently, and one in Texas. And, and what, what, we certainly got to sit and wait and let the dust settle. We can't be pointing fingers. I don't care who you are because nobody's immune to this. You know, you, you're in a small department. You're in a large department. Uh, I remember years and years ago knowing so many guys that worked in the city. You know, they used to say the guys that worked in Staten Island, they, they, oh, they work in a camp. Those guys wear pajamas at night when they go to bed. They're, they're not getting out of bed. And then a guy gets killed in Staten Island, and all of a sudden it's not a camp anymore, you know. But if we have to treat each and every – place and every nook and cranny in, in the country with that same respect and due regard because you can get killed in the same house fire in in Kansas as you can in New York City. Uh, I'd like to get back to the uh, to the uh, uh, the decision making and the, some of the things we looked at. Uh, there was a white paper written about two years ago by the police chief. Uh, they have a female police chief in Folsom, California. Her name is Chief Cynthia Renault. And uh, she did a phenomenal white paper. Uh, she, I think, I, it might have been uh, through her graduate program. She might have went to the Post Naval Graduate School on emergency management. But she talked about, she coined the phrase, and, and I'm going to read it so, so I get it right. She called it how to function on the edge of chaos. And, and in fact, Jim Murtaugh had sent it to me two years ago and said, you got to read this. And she was spot on. She said, we, you know, she talks about NIMS. And she said, the NIMS system is wonderful. It works great when you have this large incident. You got lots of people coming. You got lots of help. Um, you got time to set up your base camp and all the other stuff you got to do. She said, but well, operating on the edge of chaos is that first five or 10 or 15 minutes. And it's not, not necessarily, I mean, you can get the pucker factor from a two and a half story frame with two kids trapped on the top floor. But what if you got five houses on fire? Well, for you, Tommy, what if you got 10,000 acres burning it real quick because the winds are coming out of the south at 40 miles an hour? Uh, so it, it's it, – and she, what her point was we don't train our people for that moment. We don't train our officers, lieutenants, captains, battalion chiefs, incident commanders, whoever, for that operating on the edge of chaos. And, and Jim told me a story. He says – he told me a story. He had a fire one night in the Bronx. He went on a second alarm. He was a deputy. And uh, when he pulled up, they had a church, and I think he said three houses. The wind was blowing at 40, and he said he got out of the car, and he got vapor lock. And he had, was already 30 years on the job by that point. And he, had, he got vapor lock for about 10 seconds. And the battalion chief was standing there saying, Chief, what do you need? And he kind of woke him out of the trance. And then he, after that 10 seconds, he started, it, it kicked in again, so to speak. So everybody, you know, now pick, picture a lieutenant with eight years or nine years in a, in a slower area pulling up and having five five frame houses on fire when he pulls up. We don't train our people for that moment. We need to start looking at things like that. And and what we're, we're hoping to do is this project I'm working on with him and and, uh, and uh, Jack is is to kind of try to get to the root of some of that with the, that, that that decision making that 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 what needs to be near the top and like I said brain number 1 versus brain number 2 and things like that. So uh yeah, you know, a, a couple of things you mentioned it was uh, with due regard, and uh, perhaps uh, you know we talk about variable locking decision making. Where do you think uh, this question for for both of you? Where do you think uh, standard operating procedures fit into all of this stuff? And with regards to uh, accountability, 
um, you know, I guess maybe coming out of that vapor lock, and, and, and what are we what are we falling back on, and, and what, where, do, where does where do SOPs fall into that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a combination of a couple of things, Eric, and that's a, that's a really good question. Um, to me, I, I tell people the, the 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 basic foundation of your safety program in your fire department is your training program and your SOPs. Those two things together, and you should be training to your SOPs, so they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so I, that's really we, what we come to rely on is our training and, and the SOPs so everybody's on the same song sheet. And then the, 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 the variable to that is the stuff that's kicking into your head, the slideshow going off. I've been here before. I've seen this. Fire on the top floor, fire on the first floor, blah, blah, blah. What did we do last time? Did it work? Do we do it again? Don't we do it again? Of course, all of those questions are being asked and asked and answered inside of five seconds, and you guys know that. So I, I, I think what, what happens is if we, if we have good, solid SOPs or SOGs, depending on your department, okay, and you train to your SOPs, that's what you're going to rely on. And when all else fails, at least we're singing off the same song sheet. Uh, Tommy? Yeah, and I agree with you, Ron. The, the SOPs are extremely important, and of course, making sure that you're trained to them, and then they're not just sitting in a in a book somewhere, and you refer to them when somebody gets in trouble. But you know, you hit upon it. I think the uh, the RPDM, the the recognition prime decision making, or the neuro linguistic stuff that that's out there is extremely important. Of of we're not going to as many fires. So if we're doing simulation training. And there's some the technology is really caught off with, with some of that stuff, and giving the guys a chance to practice that before they actually get out on a real fire ground, let them trip and fall during the, the trainings. But hopefully it'll make them a more astute incident commander when they get out there. Trying to remember that that strategically placed guy is is the big picture one, and uh, you know we we looked at some of the line of duty deaths. Uh, I'll go back to Hackensack Ford uh, in in '85 when what the uh, the incident commander was seeing on the outside of the building definitely did not match the interior conditions of that and making sure that that information gets communicated to the guys inside of you know what this thing's looking like a like a turd let's let's get everybody out of the building and regroup uh, I, I don't want the SOPs to be so uh, minute that it doesn't give the opportunity for the company officers not to do some decision making you know, I, 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 I'm not a, a fan of you'll pull an inch and three-quarter line on every time you have a one-room job or uh, some stuff that's written so micromanaged that uh, it doesn't give the company officers the chance to deviate from that depending on the situation. And there is still some of that stuff floating around, but I'd like to think that the, our training programs would be realistic enough to make sure that the company officers have some of that information and are able to make decisions based upon that. Now, I, I absolutely agree with you, Tommy. Um, I, I, at my last job, we went to guidelines. We did, uh, we did standard operating guidelines, and, and we told the officers, you have to have some flexibility. I had one captain, and we nicknamed him Captain Black and White. Okay, that was the nickname. It had to be black and white. He wanted every single thing in writing. And, of course, first of all, if we're going to put every single thing in writing, we're never going to get out from under it. That's that's number one. Uh, number two, it's 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 it, it limits... The, the judgment and the ability of your officers on the fire ground to, to have to just bend something, skirt something, whatever. As long as nobody's going to get hurt, you do what you got to do. You know, even like you say, it's as simple as the size of the line. You know, they pull up, it says engine three quarter for, for this kind of thing. Maybe he wants to pull a two and a half with a blitz. You know, God bless you. Pull the two and a half with a blitz. You know, go ahead. So we have to have that flexibility. But, but the SOPs and, or SOGs or guidelines, they, they're there to act as a framework. And if, if we stay within the framework, we're going to be a lot better off than if we just everybody's kind of doing what they want, like in the old days. Everybody kind of did what they want, you know. But I, but I, I think that what it, it also makes, going back to what Eric asked about, the incident, it makes the incident commander's job easier. If, if, you look at large, if you look at large city fires and you study their fires, just look at video. Okay, and I was on the fire ground in New York, and, and I've, I've watched it, I've participated, but I've watched it, and, and it's an it's a, it's a automatic, orchestrated uh, system. The first two engine, second two engine, third two engine, first two truck, second two truck, the rest, they come in, and they already know what their tasks are. They already know what they're going to do. The first two engine stretches the line. The second two engine helps them stretch that line. 
The third new engine stretches the second line, and all that. And, and if the first truck goes to the fire floor, the second truck goes above the whatever. So it's it's orchestrated. That makes the incident commander's job pretty easy. He doesn't have to worry about those tactical things going on. He can actually sit back and get get the view from thirty thousand feet and start making decisions and start forecasting. Well, what's you know what's happening now? What can happen next? That that situational awareness part we talk about. You know, and what what am I? Going to you, you, you hit the nail on the head and something that, uh, you know, you know I'm a big fan of the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. Right. I spend a lot of time buffing down there when I'm on the East Coast. And uh, when uh, Rube was the fire chief down there, he was working to put together a job guide that, that basically spelled out, you know, as you arrive on the fire ground, here's, here's what you probably should be doing. You know, first truck to the front, second truck to the back. And with the row houses, they're stretching lines in through the front and the rear. And... In my world, you know, that, that smells uh, like an opposing hose line problem. And I asked Dennis, I said, you know, what the, is there an issue with that? He says, no, they've been doing it this way for so long and are so aware of the fact that the lines are coming in from different directions that it doesn't create a problem. Hmm. And, and, and you're right, that, that framework laid out, and especially in the busier jobs where, uh, where guys are doing it all the time, it's, it's like poetry in motion. Right, right. And, and and now I, you know I, I had a nice chat with with uh, Chuck Downey last year at FDIC. I was, Chuck and Joe uh, were backstage when we gave out the Downey Medal, and I have I have the privilege and the honor to uh, uh, to be part of that selection committee, and I, I get a chance to chat with them once a year for about an hour. But Chuck Chuck's working out in Queens now, and and they they they've they've kind of they've changed some of their training. They're looking at flow path. They're looking at all the the NIST stuff. And he said, he says, my, my fires are going textbook. I'm having textbook fires. He says, the guys are being patient because, you know, they want to go and start venting and all that stuff. But they're actually being patient. He says, and they, they're doing what we need them to do for, for a, a good operation. He says, and, and, and uh, the fires are going out. We're saving structures and we're saving lives and all that stuff. So it's, it's but it's, it's, it's a little bit orchestrated. I, I try to do that. Where I was in my last command up in southeast Connecticut on a county basis, you know, we worked with the largest cities up there, which basically New London was the big city and the city of Norwich. I talked about even on mutual aid, you know, you have a small fire department when you have two and two. That's the career department. And then you got a third due truck coming in or a third due engine coming in. Let's set up procedures with third due work. You know, unless you're, unless you're told something else by the incident commander, if you're coming in third due into the city of New London, Here's what you're going to be doing. If, you, if you're the third truck in the city, here's what you're going to be doing. Because the first truck is already engaged with search. The second truck's already on the roof. Here's the third truck. So try to get that all done. Uh, we started to put it in writing, and then I left, and I'm not sure what happened after that. So, <laughs> You know, but, it, uh, it brings to mind that, you know, I hate to keep getting back to the blue card thing, but, I mean, it does some pretty cool stuff, <laughs> the whole level one and level two staging thing. Uh, level one staging is a beautiful thing because it gives me time to think about what, I need to do with the companies that are coming in, and if they're hanging back for a block, that's a that's a beautiful thing. Hey, Eric, I, I just wanted to kind of jump back to one thing on the IC thing and uh, kind of gather your and Ron's thoughts on uh, criminal liability for the incident commander. Where where are we going with this? Uh, you guys got any thoughts? I'm going to defer. I'm going to defer to Eric because of his his status as a a national magazine publisher. He might have his hand on, he might have his hand on the pulse a little bit better than me. What, what are you hearing out there, Eric? Uh, actually, you know, I mean, there have been been incident commanders that have been jammed up in the court system uh, for some of the actions and decisions that they made. And um, obviously, it's very very difficult to prove or you know even disprove that the actions of the incident commander were in fact the the direct result. So I think we're still you know in that gray area with regard to, you know, just like arson and, you know, investigation, you know, there was a, a, a major uh, mediational shift in, in arson investigation in terms of um, what we knew, what we didn't know, we didn't know about it, and, and what could actually stick in court. So they debunked uh, some of the um, burn pattern stuff and evidence collection and what the fire department does, you know, you know the consequences of overhaul and, and salvage and, and everything else and, and what the impact that has to to close some of these cases, so I think we're also seeing that with the incident commander. Um, you know, however, you know, I mean, we, we look at some of the, the incident commander uh, litigation we've seen on the training ground. You know, who was in charge and and um, somebody that was you know seriously injured on, at a training incident. They want to know who was in charge. You know, who uh, who said go, and you know, essentially, you know, any 
any attorney is going to look at a, an incident commander and say, okay, who's the one that said go? And uh, that, that'll be the individual scrutinized, which is what we're seeing with our two recent cases. So, And that's coming you know, in as well. So I, 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 I'm not sure, you know, as we, we start getting, you know, a little more specific with this, um, you, and, and if there is any criminality that, that we can prove or, or disprove. So I, 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 I think it might, it, if, if anything, that they, they would try to prove negligence. You know, yeah, and, and negligence is hard to prove because, right. because you, you you know you really have to be, I hate to say this, you got to be negligent in your duties, and and I don't care if it's if it's the two guys that the, the two incident commanders in, in in Connecticut and Dallas, I don't care who it is, they're gonna have to prove negligence that the guy was negligent in his duties. And it's, well, when not negligence, it's gonna be very hard to to prove. You know, I mean, it's hey, I didn't see something, and you know, I had three chiefs at this fire, and they didn't see the same, you know. They didn't see the same thing everyone else saw, so I think it, you, you'll, you'll have to, you know, uh, I guess qualify what uh, wa uh, willful and wanton negligence uh, really is on the fire ground. So, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, that's some of the things that, that kind of kick around in my mind about some of this stuff, and you know, still uh, performing the uh, the IC duties out there. Of uh, you know, what are the performance standards that are we going to be held up against, and, and what's out there? And, and are we accountable for our actions? Well, you're damn straight you're accountable for your actions. You're the incident commander. You're the one that's supposed to be giving these guys a round trip ticket on the fire ground to make sure they get out of there. But those uh, discretionary functions and, and fire ground decisions that are out there are certainly going to be looked at, and they're going to be held up against what the, the standard should be that. And, and can a fire department be held liable for not training its company officers and chief officers and good incident command practices. Uh, yeah, you know what is? What, you know, I was. You know, I, I went through a uh, a deposition once on an incident. It was uh, it was a gas leak that went south. And I'll tell you what the um, the the people that they brought in and the research that they did was was astounding in terms of um, you know what they were what they were trying to prove. And that negligence was the uh, you know the dependent variable and all that. So. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we're we're, we're definitely uh, you know headed that way on a, on a little more holistic scale of the overall incident and uh, who, you know who did what when, who said go, uh, et cetera. So yeah, very good points. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I am certainly not going to uh, belittle the fact that you know I started off as a volunteer firefighter in a company that was a combination department, but I look at some of the companies that are that are hundred percent that are still electing officers, which has worked uh, for years. But I think the the piece that might be missing with some of that is if you get elected into those positions, we got to make sure we train them up to what the standard is to actually run the fire ground in a, in a safe and efficient manner. You, you know, I, I've come across that uh, since the uh, Courage to Be Safe, Everyone Goes Home program has been uh, was invented 10 years ago. I've been out there preaching. In fact, I, I was I preached last uh, Thursday night right, right in the next town over from us uh, for the volunteer fire department. And... We talk about you know the the volunteer fire service uh, as 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 they are uh, and and whether or not they're still like you say Tommy electing their offices you know is it is it a popularity vote because you know that guy buys every Friday night or or is it the real guy and what I tell them is without without insulting them or hurting their feelings because I was a volunteer for years as well uh, is whatever however whatever means you use. To put your officers in, whether you elect them, whether they have to go to school, whether they have credentials, understand that particularly the chief officers, that's the guy outside the house who's going to make the decision to pull you out. If you're comfortable with your best buddy because he's a great guy, but he hasn't been to school or hasn't seen a fire yet, and you still want him to be the chief, that's okay. But understand something. He's not going to be able to make that decision to pull you and your buddies out when you got to be pulled out. So you guys have to decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And, and I know volunteer fire departments in a lot of places where they tell you the day you walk in the door, if you want to be chief here, it's going to take you 14 years, and this is the curriculum you're going to have to go through to be considered to even run for election to be the chief. So they're doing it the right way. you got to, you know, fire yeah. officer, fire officer too. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not trying to belittle anything. I mean, you look at some of the volunteer companies in PG County, Montgomery County, they're, they're kicking butt. Uh, Probably some of the most efficient firefighting I've seen, but you got to make sure that the guy you're going to put standing in the street is the one that'll be able to recognize the conditions that are going on and say, you know what, it's time to get out of there. Yeah, I, I I agree. 
I agree. And I think a lot of that is going to tie back into uh, the stuff that uh, Dan and Steve are doing on uh, the modern fire behavior. Uh, the more I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of what they're, they're preaching. Uh, the, the slicers video that the, uh, the instructors came out with. I made sure I ran all our people through it so they're familiar with it. Thankfully, being in rural America, you know, we're kind of used to operating from the outside for the first couple minutes. But I mean, it, that is the most definitive piece of education that I've seen that will save lives on the fire. I, I, I agree, Tommy. I, you know, I got here, I got a six-man crew, and, and, I, and I laid that on them when I got here. You, have you guys seen, this was in June, have you seen the research? Have you watched the NIST? Have you watched, you know, the UL stuff? And they looked at me and said, we don't want to brag, but we think we invented that. <laughs> Because they, they they've been working with a six man crew here for so long, they don't have a you know they don't have a choice but to operate like that. And 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 I said the most important thing to me for them was I I need you guys to know what you can't do versus what you can do. Everybody knows what they can do, and then there were things that you think you can do. I said, do you know your limitations? And they all said yes. I said that's all I want to know because I you know the six of you pulling up, they, they, again same thing, Tommy, just like your outfit. They're gonna they're gonna do some transitional work and then they're gonna try to get in and make a difference. So and then to, on on top of it all, uh, two thirds of my town doesn't have fire hydrants and and I, I recently asked the water company to send me the fire hydrant seeds to plant along the road. We can water them once a week and maybe we'll grow hydrants coming out of the ground because I'm on a learning curve. But the guys here they know what they're doing. They they, they really have their act together. So they make my job a lot easier. In, uh, operating in rural America right now, I finally figured out what the big silver trucks are that are full of water and uh, what we're supposed to eat those for. Perfect. Perfect. What do you got, Eric? Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, I think that that's, you know, that, that is the dichotomy in the fire service, you know. Um, we do have rural America, we have suburban America, we have urban America. You know, where I work, um, you know, I'm fortunate I get to manage adequate resources and you know, the converse of not having enough people show up initially, um, and they both require the same amount of decision making, is I want to make sure, again, as yeah, I see that the, the fire goes according to plan, similar to what we, we talked about earlier in the conversation with order of arrival, uh, predetermined assignments, et cetera. We, we have that. It's a great framework because, you know, essentially when I arrive, um, I make sure it's going according to plan, and as people arrive, uh, they're going where they're supposed to be going. So, and if they're not where they're supposed to be, then, you know, I adjust and manage it accordingly. Um, but, you know, we, we have to you know instill that patience that uh, that Ron mentioned earlier, where obviously everybody that that arrives on scene wants to do something the second they get there. And you know, with, with 35 guys coming, they all want to do something. They they don't like you know stopping by the command post for more than a millisecond uh, before they go do something. So we have to look at that. So you know, again, conversely, if you're showing up with, with six guys on a rig. Um, that same decision making has to come is where do I place my, my arriving companies? What can I accomplish before uh, you know these, these assignments can be handled? And I, I think um, you know when we correlate the UL stuff to that, there, there's definitely uh, you know, a dichotomy and a different way to approach both of that with regards to how fast can we get a handline in service? Where do we take that handline? If I have uh, a three man engine company that, that arrives um, and I fire out three windows, I mean. You know, it sounds commonsensical on the surface if I pull up with three or four guys, uh, also with, uh, you know, pulling up with 12 to 15 uh, initially with regards to protecting the stairwell, protecting the search, and, and getting this, this stuff underway. So um, I, I think that's maybe a focus that's lacking in the fire services, uh, you know, looking at that juxtaposition and really um, putting it all together with regards to, you know, when and how we can get it all and, and make it all happen eventually. So, well, you know, it's, 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 I go, I, 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 we're seeing a shift, and you know when I was coming up, uh, late '70s, uh, we were basically told if you stick a line in a window, you're going to push fire and you're going to kill whoever's in that building. And we lived and died by that for for the you know the, the last 25 years. And, and we're getting smarter. We're, we're looking at the science now. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of it's going to be a cultural shift. Uh, when I was working in uh, North Jersey, I mean, we emulated ourselves over the guys over at FDNY because they were the big brother. Then you look at so many other great departments that are out there, Jersey City, Newark, Patterson, all the guys that were hard hitters and, and aggressive interior firefighters was what we all wanted to be. And now we're looking at it and saying, you know what, you know, it's not a completely defensive tactic 
from hitting it from the outside. It's a, it's an, a, an offensive uh, exterior attack, if you would. Get the fire knocked down, and I think Bruno put it uh, uh, eloquently a number of times. You know what? If you put the fire out, a lot of your problems are going to go away. Yeah, I, I, and you know what? It, it is, Tommy. I agree with both of you guys. This is a big paradigm shift. This this is the same stuff we talked about when we when we when we launched the Everyone Goes Home program. You know, at the first meeting in Tampa in 2004, we we all sat and looked at each other and said. Okay, so we're going to try to change the way a million firefighters think. Did you ever try to decide on a pizza after a meeting with 10, 10 chiefs? Forget it. Now we're going to change the way a million firefighters think. It's hard. So this whole transitional thing, I tell you, I had a great conversation. I was at Tampa 2 in March of this year on a 10-year anniversary, and we 350 of us looked at the Everyone Goes Home program. Uh, I had a great conversation with Sal Cassano. I, I was facilitating one of the one of the breakout sessions with uh, uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, God forgive me. The, the young man from uh, Columbia Southern University. I can't I can't think of his name. But we were Billy Hayes. Billy Hayes. Billy Hayes. Right. We were, we were co co uh, cohabitating for two days in the room, and we had we had people in our breakout session, and we had we had uh, uh, Sal Cassano and and Steve Rainis and the other safety chiefs in the room along with Dan Madrakowski and Steve Kerber and our, our group was to talk about thermal assault on the firefighter. What was what does thermal assault look like today? How can we protect the guys? What can we do to prevent and all that other stuff? And, and outside the room I had a chat with Sal before we went in and we talked about well one of the things I asked him was is, is if I can humanize them when we get inside the room because there were a lot of intimidated people in there and a, and a couple of people as we went around the room, we're kind of starting to choke a little bit because they, they couldn't speak in front of Cassano. And he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your whole life. So after he says, yeah, you do what you want to me, I don't care. I said, I said what, what do you think about the, the transitional stuff and the NIST studies you guys just did? He said, Ron, I've been in a job 40 years. He said, I was vehemently opposed to this, vehemently opposed. Can't happen, won't work, can't work. He says, I looked at the science, and you can't argue with the damn science. So we're going to do things differently from now on, and we're retraining all our people. He says, and I got there are old timers in the job like me who are going to try to convince this is the way to go, but they're doing it. So it, it's hard to, to get guys to go to a new way of thinking, a new pattern. But the, the toughest part is teaching them patience. That's the toughest part. You know, one of the things we talk about. One of the life safety initiatives, one of the 16, is responding to incidents of violence. It's like a hazmat job. It's a hurry up and wait. You get there in four minutes, and you're going to stand around for 10 or 20. It's like, what? we got to do something, you know? So, you know, it reminds me back of a, uh, a lecture that Gordon Graham was doing at one of the Redmond symposiums, and, you know, talking about the, <clears throat> the makeup of firefighters. And, you know, why are we in such a hurry? You know, slow down. Slow down. Get off the meth. Get on some heroin. <laughs> Slow down and, 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 and take a look at what's going on. And I think little Chief Cameron would agree uh, like 100%. Don't you think, Ron, that's a good idea? Okay, good. All right, enough with the little Chief Cameron. I'm a little tired of that routine, okay? Because if I show you the little Chief on national cable here, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> you know, but I'll tell you what. You know, I'd like, uh, you know, um, I'd like to mention the, you know, Poetry emotion and it, you know, it's kind of changed. I guess the, uh, you know, we're going back to being beat poets. I guess uh, uh, with regards to you know, short, wait, you know, get the line in place, um, getting enough people to get the line in place, and uh, starting water on the fire is kind of where, uh, where we've always gone. And you know, like Ron mentioned at the, the beginning of the hour here, um, we've been talking about controlling the door for years, and you know, we we talk about and the questions always posed. You know, should we go back to basics? Do we have to, you know, look at engine work again with all the seawall stuff? The answer is yes and yes. Um, but you know, a lot of jobs have had that in their books for years, and I think, uh, and maybe this is a good way to finish the conversation today. We talk about, um, you know, the new firefighters, firefighters that have come into this job in the last five to eight years, and you know how a lot of jobs are rewriting their books, and how we still need to, to ensure that those. Uh, uh, Truisms are put in the book, and those sound tactics are put in the uh, the uh, the new books that we're writing. I mean, um, controlling the door is everything. We, you know, we do it on private dwellings, multiple dwellings, uh, you know, high-rise residential, commercial, and you know, to 
you know, not focus on that and to look at that as uh, something we need to refocus on. I think it's been a faux pas in the, in the fire service for a while, but, um, but uh, you know, I, I just I, a lot of good points on this. So I guess let me let me. Uh, well, we'll we got another about ten or fifteen minutes here. Um, you know, one thing I want to talk about was were, were the, uh, the new generation and, and, and our new firefighters and how do we get them uh, more engaged? And we talk about the IC, we talk about you know the company officer, we talk about firefighters and, and our drivers. You know, how do we get these new firefighters to you know buy into you know all the new stuff, buy into the job, and uh, become those uh, you know future decision makers? And you know, obviously, we've all the three of us have been in culture in a specific way in the fire service. Um, but I think again we've seen that shift um, to a you know I don't say a new culture, but the the questioning that you know a culture of, of safety, culture of extinguishment. Um, how do we just enculture somebody into the fire service today and 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 and, and push all these points home and uh, you know not lose what's been great for 30 years and and uh, also what's been great for the last year um, that's kind of made us really think stuff. You know what what's your advice or, or what's your approach? You, uh, to do this. So, so again, to finish up, so it, our incident commanders are, are making those sound decisions so we're not seeing this uh, vicious cycle uh, 20 years from now with these new firefighters becoming incident commanders. You know, uh, Eric, it, it, it's a, uh, it, it, for me, I mean, I'm a traditionalist. Fifth generation, I love the traditions of this job. I mean, I, I, I eat and breathe them. But I'm also very attuned to the fact we need to create a culture of safety. And that's got to start at basic training. It's got to start while you're going through the academy. When the guys get out on the street, it's got to continue through department leadership. And you got to be strong about it. I mean, it's easy to look the other way if you got a guy maybe not wearing the, uh, the bottom strap of his SCBA and tell him, you know what, you need to hook that up. It's there for a reason. But you got to permeate that whole attitude throughout the entire organization. And, and sometimes that's where we lose sight of it. A lot of the older guys may become a little complacent. They're like, ah, you know, forget what they taught you in the academy. We'll show you how we do it here on the street. And trying to get away from some of that stuff to make sure that we all operate so that everybody gets to come home. And I think that's our greatest challenge as leaders in the fire service is to make sure that not only the new guys understand it coming up, but also the the, uh, the other parts of the organization, the older guys, the uh the, the company officers have that buy-in to, to understand why it's so important. You know, I, I, I agree with you, Tom, but and I think I think the, the it's easy with new guys. It's easy because they, they have nothing to, to, to base it on. They have nothing to compare it to. You get a young kid, maybe a volunteer at 18 or a career guy coming at 21, you put them through fire school, you, and you give them – so the, the religion starts at the fire academy. That's where it starts because that guy has nothing else to compare it to. Okay, so if we give it to them from the Giddy app, uh, right off the bat, then that's we're going to be able to teach them the culture. The the problem arises when they're finished with school and they get to the firehouse. And the, Tommy, you you already alluded to it. Well, t forget what you learned at the academy, kid. We'll teach you how it's done here. Now, there's something to be said for um, what's done in the street versus what's done at the fire academy. You know, it, I I been to some academy graduations. We had great speakers, and and one of them said once. You guys learned everything you could here in the fire academy, but in the next 30 days, some of you may have been to your first real fire, and you'll really understand it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I think when you have new guys, it's easy. And, and what, we've, what we've done is we've started to, to instill that safety culture in, into the new guys uh, by, by presenting everyone goes home in a four-hour block as part of the curriculum. We do it here at the Connecticut State Fire Academy. They do it at the regional academies. They're doing it in New Jersey. It became part of the curriculum. It, it really, if we're going to change the fire service, it's going to start with the new guys coming in, and it's going to start with strong leadership in the fire departments everywhere in the country to, to, for those leaders to get together with their incumbent crews and say, hey, these six kids show up. Don't be showing them all that other stupid crap that we've been. Don't show them all your bad habits, because we all had bad habits. You know, they're gonna buckle up. They're, they're gonna they're gonna use their chin strap on their helmet. They're gonna wear a hood. You guys should be doing the same. But you gotta close your, your bottom buckle on your SCBA. Same thing. Seat belts. All of that stuff. We we don't want you to teach them the bad habits. Don't let me catch you teaching them bad habits. So. Uh, starting with the young guys, I think, is easy because they have nothing to compare it to. It's a matter of when we get them into the real world and teaching them how to operate, how to behave, and all that other stuff. 
uh, and it's hard today because I, you know, I have a 27 year old daughter. I have a 32 year old niece. They're kind of the same generation, and if, boy, do they have a different view of the world, probably as we did when we were 20 and 25. Uh, but but uh, you know, I, I we had a kid come into the firehouse in my last command, and and he he was 20 years old, in, into a career job. And he, he, he believed he had the right, some privileges, to do anything and everything he wanted to within the first week. And, and it doesn't necessarily work like that. You know, you kind of have to earn your way in because this is a trust job. Everybody has to trust the guy behind them, next to him, and in front of him, you know, including the guy in the street. So uh, I, I think that those are some of the issues. Can we teach them? Yeah, they could be taught because, like I said, it's fresh meat. We could teach them anything we want to teach them. But it's it's getting them into the reality of the firehouse and in the real world where we try to maintain that. We're actually when when we're done here today, I, I just got put on a task force here in Connecticut. We we put together a firefighter health and safety task force statewide. We've got three fire department doctors on it. We have a researcher from Yale University. We have a bunch of chiefs, a couple of union guys, and our, our mantra is we want to take you from rookie to rest home. From rookie to rest home. From the minute you come into the fire service, you're physically fit to go to the fire academy, and you'll maintain your fitness, nutrition, and well-being right through your 30 years, and then up until the time when you're about 85 and they will you into the home, and you can stare out the window and look at the squirrels go by. So that that's what we're trying to do here in Connecticut, and we should be trying to do that, I guess, everywhere in the United States. But we we we, we I don't know if we if we're if we're ahead of the curve or we're behind it. Everybody else has done it already, but we're trying to put this program together. And it's based on fitness, wellness, nutrition, all that stuff, safety, right from the giddy app. Again, from rookie to rest home. That's what we're trying to do. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think the health and wellness is going to become a uh, very, uh, a much larger component of our job. I know that sounds cliche, and we've been it's a, in a broken record. Uh, but like I said in prior hangouts, you know, I, I remember you know going into uh, um, a, a truck with a lot of senior guys. You know, my my first month on the job, I was detailed for the day, and there was a guy with a cigarette in his mouth buttering a donut um, in the kitchen table. <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't back then, you know, saw me doing that. But uh, you know, anyway. Obviously, we, we you know we we've uh, we've we've come a long way since then, but uh, you know in all seriousness, you know I mean in, in Fire Rescue Magazine, Fire Engine, we're really going to be uh, uh, pushing the health and wellness, kind of uh, introducing a lot of the best practices out out there. I'd love to see what you guys are doing in Connecticut, and I, would, I definitely want to uh, follow up and and uh, keep in tune with what you guys are up to. But you know we're uh, we have a major uh, firefighter physiology and cancer study that will be uh, underway in January. Um, with uh, Skidmore College and the University of Illinois, um, I think that you know, much like the UL stuff, that's going to be groundbreaking and eye-opening. I mean, we're looking at um, you know reinventing bunker gear and, and it's uh, you know what it you know what it does to reduce our, our risk for cancer, et cetera. I mean, it's which transcends washing your hood on, on weekends. You know, I mean, um, we we need to you know sell these these points home, and and I, I really think we're going to do that. So you know, I might have Eric. Guys what? what? One of the, one of the, the, the neatest things I heard at FDIC this year, and, and we, we kind of, you know, you stand in the hall of the conference center and you talk in groups. You know, I was talking to Billy and, and, and Bobby and a couple of guys, and somebody said in the group, I won't take credit for it, but somebody said, it's our obligation, it's our duty to wipe out firefighter cancer in our lifetime so the, the generation of firefighters coming up behind us don't have to battle this at all. And, and that's what I've, I've been carrying that, that torch now. When I do my everyone goes home or I'm just doing regular training or I'm teaching at the college, whatever, we get to talk about firefighter safety somehow in the conversation. And I, and I tell the firefighters in the classes, in, in the back room, in the firehouse, this is our obligation. It's our job to make sure that we lick this cancer thing, firefighter cancer, so the next generation doesn't have to have a firefighter cancer support network. It's up to us. Oh, I, I agree. You know, I mean, we just had a um – Another individual that that's uh, just became very ill, um, and you know, I'll tell you what I know uh, a lot of firefighters on um, you know in the fire service of my job and, and throughout the country that have um, you know have had cancer, and, and I'll tell you what these aren't you know are, are people at the rest home. You know, they're not they're people on their way to the rest home. They are they are young, they are able, they are fit and capable, and you know I, I think it is incumbent upon us to to finally. You know, you know, put our foot down and really look at, at everything we're doing. And um, you know, 
there are control measures we can put in a place. And uh, I mean, we're going gangbusters to find those. So definitely, uh, you know, just stay tuned to what's going on in, uh, in Connecticut uh, with Skidmore and U of I and definitely with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. So look for a lot of uh, editorial material coming out on that. So we are going to you know, blow it up, make sure that, that everybody is aware that, uh, you know what, we're putting our, our money, time, and, and resources where our mouths are on this one, and we're going to take it head on this time for, uh, for real. Great. Great. Yeah. What else you got, buddy? So, uh, just Go ahead. Uh, Hang on. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, 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 the modern fire behavior stuff, and, and if you guys haven't seen the Slicers video, the one thing that really hit me hard when I was watching that stuff, and of course Eddie Buchanan is a very smart and eloquent guy, but when they were talking about uh, Reese OBS versus Slicers, and they didn't take the, uh, they didn't throw it out. Uh, and I'm a huge Lloyd Blamant fan. Uh, I'm actually going back to looking at some of his stuff and incorporating it into some of the lectures that I've been doing. But, you know, they look at uh, Reese OBS for the, uh, the strategically placed incident commander and slicers for the guy that's first arriving on scene to try to think about some of those tactical priorities and the stuff you need to get done so the guy coming in behind you can kind of slide in and look at the bigger picture. But, uh, you know, I, I think... If we don't learn from the past, we are certainly condemned to repeat it. And I know somebody a lot smarter than I did came up with that uh, phraseology. But, you know, even though we're looking at modern stuff, don't lose sight of the lessons from the past. And try to incorporate some of that stuff in together with the goal of making sure that everybody gets a round trip ticket on the fire ground. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I just uh, I just previewed the fire dynamics video that uh, uh, Dan Madrakowski, Teddy Nee. Yeah. And uh, the other guy, <laughs> so sorry, John Sorrell. No. Yeah, they, I got mine I'm up. So. Right here. <laughs> yep. yep, I'm holding mine up now. I don't know if you could see it on the on the on the, the screen there, but I got mine up here, and and I and I it was great. I mean, it was it was it was a little basic to start, but it, it's it's okay to have a review on the basic stuff. You know, that's all right. But they certainly talked about you know the the, the non vented fire and and that waiting. To have everything in place, you know, and they talked about uh, uh, VEIS and all that stuff, and and it's this thing, this little video, this 40-minute video, is so timely, and it really tells the story. I think it's you know, it, that was a home run. That was really a home run these guys hit. So I, you guys that are listening or watching out there, it's the Fire Dynamics uh, DVD that was just put out, uh, Dan Majukowski and and company. So uh, get it. Uh, we're certainly going to be using it here. That's for sure. Uh, what? No. Who's got? Well, who's tell you what, everybody, we're uh, we're uh, we're kind of uh, at our end here. Um, I'll tell you what, this was a, a great hangout, great discussion. Uh, this is one we definitely needed another hour on. Um, but uh, you know, I'd like to thank Ron and, and Tom for, for joining us today. Again, uh, you'll look for their show, uh, Backstep uh, uh, Backstep Boys, on the uh, Fire Engineering and the Talk Radio Network. Um, great show. These guys uh, definitely keep you uh, you entertained and and. Uh, a lot of great stuff similar to what you've heard today. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for watching today. I'd like to thank our guests. And, uh, you know, again, we're, we'll be back next Wednesday with our uh, our next hangout with some uh, new guests. And I'll definitely have uh, Ron and Tom back on. This was a great uh, great talk today and uh, two, uh, you know, great gentlemen in the fire service. So uh, Ron and Tom, again, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. And uh, for all of you watching, thank you very much. And uh, be safe out there. Take care. Be safe.